please welcome to the stage, David Hampill. So I'm really excited to be here at uh, Laracon AU, the first one ever. Uh, kind of a privilege to be amongst the first speakers. Um, thanks to Michael Dorinda for throwing on a good event, man, for the first one. Yeah. So, and, and Telescope, man, I didn't know anything about Telescope literally until yesterday when I finally got to look at it, which is surprising because we had such a big involvement with Nova. Um, so he keeps that under his hat pretty well, I guess. Um, but if you don't know me, allow me to introduce myself. My name's David Hempill. There's my stuff. Um, you might see my face around the Laravel internet land, maybe. Um, I'm from a remote part of the United States called the Ozarks. And basically, I, from what I understand, that's like your version of Bogans. That's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> we call those rednecks where I'm from. So uh, this is my wife. Uh, I think you guys call her, call that your lady, Sheila. Is <laughs> Sheila? This is my Sheila and my partner in crime, Tess. That's just in Albuquerque before, we, before I flew out. Um, and this is my two kids, Issa and Milo. They're wearing Nova-themed outfits right here for you. <laughs> really cute, you know. And I'm a good dad. <laughs> you can tell. They, they really enjoy having me as their father. So, <laughs> um, That all qualifies me to have a, a podcast called Dads in Development, um, which I co-host with uh, Andrew Del Preti. And I've got a couple products that I've worked on, Push Silver and Cron Dog. And I've also, like Dorinda said, I've worked on uh, stuff like Forge, Spark, Laravel Horizon, Tailwind. And my favorite project is Laravel Nova to date. So that was launched uh, just recently at Laracon US. Um, how many people are using Nova? I didn't get to see because I was backstage. Yeah, there's a few of you. Sweet, thanks. <laughs> For the rest of you, uh... please buy Nova. It'll solve all your problems. Buy a license. Oh, but confession time, I was honestly, like, as I was getting on the plane, I was starting to have a panic attack, which was the first time that this ever happened to me. Um, I was kind of scared to get here. I was getting on the plane, and there was no airflow, and, you know, I was, like, stuck here. I was like, I'm going to be stuck here for, like, 16 hours or 17 hours to fly. There's no way I can get off, and it's just crazy. And I, then all the thoughts of, like, the cliches of Australia, like, you know, there's something always out here to get to get you or sting you or bite you, trying to kill you. You know, I saw Crocodile Dundee when I was a kid, and believe me, that scarred me for life. I did not like alligators or crocodiles or anything that's trying to kill me. But Sydney's been pretty, pretty tame, pretty US-like, so that's comfortable. Um, but you know what? It turns out the cliches are true. There are like 100 things ready to kill you at any moment's notice. Like, like this jacked roux here, <laughs> looking like he's about to drop a few bars or tear you apart. Or you've got this peeping Tom devil creature, it look, you know, just sticking the walls like a Spider-Man dragon. Or this thing, oh, blood-sucking, human-biting, nightmare fuel. Or this gross worm, this gigantic fish bait. Oh. And seriously, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> um, that's okay. I've calmed myself down and realized that I have martial arts skills. That's me kicking a guy in the head. Um, so I'd probably be okay, you know, and when I, when I realize when I, can, when I land, when the flight lands that I'll be able to have a bloomin' onion down at the, the snootiest restaurant you guys have to offer and wash it all down with, uh, with the Fosters, you know, yeah. I checked and it says it's Australian for beer, so. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry about that. So this is abusing Laravel for fun and profit, and today I'm going to talk about like four Laravel solutions um, to common development problems that I've run into, and you know the kind of the unconventional approaches to solving these that emerged from reusing related pieces or unrelated pieces of Laravel. So uh, in each example, I'll kind of show you what I was doing before, um, so we can see how dumb I was, and then show you what I what what I wound up as the final solution. And so the hope is not to necessarily convince you to use any one of these individual solutions, but I mean, though you totally could do that, but kind of encourage you to think out inside the box instead of reaching for a third party package, you know, next time you bump up against something. So, 
So how many people have needed to do some sort of like front end filtering for a website, like filtering a result set or doing some sort of advanced search? I don't know about you, but I, I felt like that was super painful when I was doing it. You know, it seems like even the smallest amount of filtering to a pro when added to a project really starts to get painful after a while. So like, let's say we're building an invoicing system like Push Silver, and you know this invoice. When you start off, you always have like the simplest, cleanest code that you can possibly imagine. You know, you've got um, like here, you just got an invoice controller, and you're just pulling all the invoices in when you're first developing the feature. But then one day, some product owner comes along and tells us that the customers are having a problem differentiating between the two statuses of invoices, un like unpaid and paid. And so we want to add a little drop down to allow us to filter between the two. So like we head to our controller and get to work adding us a little check for a request parameter called status. And so this changes our controller a little bit. You know, Instead of just pulling it directly and sending it to the view, we have to store the query in a new instance variable, Ugh, which Adam would probably be totally hating that. Um, and then we're doing a, a, a check on the request for a status parameter, and then we're filtering that invoice query based on that. And then we're sending that to the view. But next, those turds on the product team, they want to <laughs> add another type of filter. And so they want to add a drop down that lets you filter the results set by the client. And so we pop over to our controller and add another check, where we're checking for the client in the, in the request. And we add that where constraint on our query, our query builder instance. So now the marketing guys want to be able to paginate the results set instead of just showing them all in, in a big list. And so we add another check and default to 25 results unless the user asks for more. And you might start thinking, man, there's too much logic here. You know, but in, the truth is it's really not that bad. But the example I've shown you is not really production ready, right? You might have like database transaction calls, try catches for, for error handling. You know, you might have constructor dependencies or even like method depend or method injection dependencies for stuff. Um, some logging. You know, there's all sorts of shit that can go in there. So I know because I've done it. Um, controllers can get really gnarly without even doing anything bad per se. So what are some ways we can wrangle this code back in order? Well, we can move the invoices query to its own private function, which sort of just like moves the code to a different place, you know? It kind of feels better when we do it. Um, <laughs> but truthfully, if the controller <laughs> if the controller implements any more of the rest verbs, it's still gonna look you know like a dog's breakfast. So um, maybe we could move this code uh, some of this code to like some different classes, because it seems like we're starting to a pattern starting to develop where we're checking the request and we're you know, filtering the query builder instance. And so let's, let's, uh, let's go further down that road. So that brings us to the Illuminate pipeline. Does anybody know what that is, the Illuminate pipeline? Yeah, it's basically what powers your middleware inside of Laravel. It turns out you can use this to, to filter, do filters on the front end. Um, so what does that look like? Well, here's an example from Laravel itself. And in, uh, inside the, the bowels of Laravel, you've got the send request through router. And what it does is it stores the request, uh, bootstraps the app. And then here it uses a pipeline to send that request through uh, all of your middleware, all the middleware you just defined in, um, in your uh, middleware stack. From there, it's caught by uh, either return or a response or the exception, an exception is thrown and it's caught by the Laravel global handler. So let's see what we can do to refactor our invoice controller to use pipelines. So here's a re little refactoring of our little controller. Um, the way that, what that looks like is we're uh, using one of the best functions in Laravel, with. This is uh, like a kissing cousin to tap. If anybody use tap? Just a few, man, you gotta get on the road on the string. So what we're doing is we're spinning up a new query and then it, this closure allows us to do things with that. So 
we're getting a new pipeline instance from the, the IOC container, and we're doing that for, so that the pipeline requires an app instance, and so this kind of uh, auto-wires everything up for us. And then we're sending the request through our status and client filters, which we'll talk about in a little, in a little bit. From there, we're paginating the whole result set and then returning it. So the result of this gets sent to the view just like normal. So let's take a, head, uh, take a moment to wrap our head around what's happening again. We're getting a new query just like we were before, and then we're going to extract all of our filtering functions to classes, and then we're going to return the uh, paginated query builder to the view just like we were before. And here's what the status filter looks like. It looks a lot like a middleware class because it basically is. It follows the same contract because we're using the pipeline component. You know, it receives the request and the next filter as an argument. And we pull the query builder object out and basically say, when the request has the status parameter, uh, let's add this where constraint to the query builder. And here's a friend, the, the client filter, which does basically the same thing. Um, and it just it looks just like the other the previous filter, except that we're looking for the client parameter. By doing this, we've kind of created a really nice way of filtering the request, you know, when the marketing folks come down demanding new features for the next release. Because we can just keep adding classes to that that um, that through call right there and kind of keep all of the filters separated into their own in their own nice nice little namespace. Oh yeah. <laughs> if we want to get even more fancy, we could uh, fancy this up by pulling the relevant bits to constants and uh, protected properties, if that's the kind of thing that you like to do. Um, but that's f using front end filters using the Laravel pipeline. So. <laughs> So let, next, let's talk about feature tests powered by database feeders. You know, when we're writing tests, we often need to get the entire world of our app you know, in a certain state before we can do anything, like making assertions on stuff that we're doing. You know, and if you're following common Laravel testing practice, you might be doing the whole arrange, act, assert thing, where we arrange the pieces needed for the test, you know, act on the object, method, or feature under test, and then assert that the expected results have uh, Occurred. One common way of arranging, arranging your test data is just inlining everything right into the test. You know what? I do this all the time. <laughs> For this example, you can see we're using Laravel factories to create a user, create a team, add the user to the team. So we're calling team add user, user, or uh, should that be um, user add to team and passing the team in? I don't really know. <laughs> it's not really clear which, what you should do there. <laughs> or, and then we're setting the current team for the user so that when they log in, they see the right things on their, their dashboard. Then we're creating an API key so that they can do things via the API. And from, everything, from there, everything is in place to do some actions and assertions. But that's a lot of setup, right? And we haven't even really done anything in our app yet. You've got there's no line numbers here, but I mean, 20 lines of setup code. And if you have a bunch of tests with that, it starts to get really gnarly looking. So you might consider like trying to abstract this out a bit, right? You might stick this in a, a setup method. And so this is kind of cool. You just basically put that block of code up in the setup method and assign everything to public properties on the test. So you can just call this user. Um, and that's good, I guess. We can do a lot with this. It's not bad. but Let's say you wanted to test a bunch of more things, a bunch more things in like separate test files. What would you do there? You, you've got this concept of a user belongs to a team and does things with API keys, and so it might be something you use a lot. Well, you could extract a trait, and so like you've got a user with team setup trait, and you could extract this, that trait to uh, do the setup for each test, and that'd be a completely valid way to approach it. You just call C database um, in your tests. And you plop, when you plop that into a test, you can plop that into any test that needs it, and you're squared away. Um, I've written a lot of tests that way. But there was other, uh, something else that uh, emerged as I was on my journey that it took me a while to remember. 
there's database seeders. You, you know, like database seeders where you're just sticking um, you know, the admin users in the database when you on your production side or like example articles, videos, you know, like seeding on the front end. But I didn't, it, it took me a while to realize I could just use these for tests too. So if, uh, if you don't know, database seeders are classes that exist primarily to get your database into a particular state. And Ruby on Rails has this concept too built in, and they call them fixtures. Fixtures are YAML files filled with sample data used for testing, and they kind of look like this. So like there might be a website's fixture, and the two websites that you want to stick in the, the database when you run your test are Ruby on Rails and Google. And the way, when you require this test helper inside your Ruby test, uh, it automatically seeds the database with that, with all of the fixtures. And so you can do assertions on those fixtures. So like we're checking that Ruby on Rails is the, the name of that website, um, the fixture. But what does Laravel have? We have model factories and we have seeders. And so seeders are kind of nice for this because you can add all sorts of things. You can set up an entire specific test scenario and have access to it at any time in any test from the, hidden from the main areas of your app um, from your test. So revisiting our previous tests, by placing all of our setup for this test in a separate file, we can see how simple life gets. And our setup method, we're just calling user with team seeder, and then grabbing those from the database and assigning the pub properties. And everything gets really, really clean from there, because that leaves our test method open to just act and assert. And all the, the important uh, abstractions are, are, all important details about the setup for the test are in that user with team seeder. So there's a, f a few other things that you can do that make this a little bit of a nicer experience. You can make more seeders. So you don't have to have just one seeder that does everything and sets up every type of scenario in your app. You can break out multiple seeders to create you know, like more flexible um, compositional situations. And you can make each of those seeder classes, all of the names, really descriptive and specific. So for example, you can have seeder like user with valid API key or a team with expired building plan, or organizations over usage limit, uh, or like the creator hasn't finished setup, so you can have all, all these kind of different test scenarios that you can test against. Uh, and my favorite, customer with Nova license. <laughs> That's one of my favorite ones to test. So you can then compose all of these different seeders to kind of create like these complex test setups, and it's really handy for testing like really weird edge cases in your system where the customer writes in to help scout and they're like, I have my certain, um, you know, I have three people on my team but this, this third person can't access a certain part of the website. You can create that situation in, in a seeder, test against it, and then you basically handle that bug for the rest of your life. Um, here's another tip, you don't have to keep them with your other seeders. So you have production level database seeders you don't have to keep them inside that um, database seeds folder. You can stick them in like test slash seeds by adding them to your composer JSON's autoloader, which is pretty nice. I think this is a pretty good approach. Uh, you know, by extracting out all these test data seeders, you can really compose rich testing scenarios um, for your feature tests. <laughs> <laughs> Just end everything with a GIF and they'll clap. That's what, that's what they told me, so. <laughs> so let's talk about the database. This one's probably the one I feel like is the most controversial, but it might not be. You know, when we're creating database-driven applications, we're forced to make decisions pretty early about how we're going to interact with the data in our app. Um, it seems like there's several blessed ways to get data out of your database, like straight eloquent calls in the controller. I mean, who doesn't love some eloquent calls right in your controller. Woo! Woo! That's right. I love it. You know, I love this pattern. Do you remember the magic, magical feeling when you've cracked open a brand new Laravel application and you uh, import your model and you've got the latest 10 invoices from the database or whatever and it just all kind of really worked? I don't know. I feel like that was pretty magical for me. But <laughs> maybe I'm 
more of a simpleton. That Bogan thing, you know. Um, programming is still just kind of magical to me. So um, I still write code like this. Uh, but for shits and giggles, let's look at what other options we have out there. We've got the repository pattern and service classes, which kind of now makes me feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I learned about those patterns. And they're good patterns, by the way. They're not necessarily to be poo-pooed on. But uh, they're good patterns. And I learned about them from Papa T and Fideliper <laughs> in their books. Um, and they're really not that bad. Because you've got something similar to what we had before, right? We have a controller that accepts a constructor argument of invoice repository in interface. You know, that's an interface that um, points to a certain concrete implementation. And we're calling order by and paginate all on that repository. And that's fine, you know. Nobody's going to die here at adult. Um, repositories are great. But I've kind of fallen upon this other uh, way of getting data out of my database. And I'm calling it data access traits. You know, because a lot of the apps that I work on are really a lot simpler, and they don't need a lot of repositories. And so um, by using a trait, you know, like, you know what traits are, right? They're like the mix-ins of PHP. I love those things, man. Um, I think that gives us some, some cool opportunities here. So like, it gives us a first class, officially supported way of getting data from the database, just like a repository class would be. Um, so you don't have any ro rogue eloquent calls um, if that's a problem for you and your team. And any class can be really given these magical data grabbing superpowers. Uh, so think of like a console command that needs to talk to the database. It could use a trait uh, and get access to all those official data retrieval methods. And I, I started to notice that there was a lot of people in the Laravel community that were using this pattern. So if you've seen anything like the Forge API client, uses uh, traits to access um, the eloquent or the, the resources on your Forge account. And um, Spotsy's um, ODIR app follows a similar method where they use traits to access data in the database. And here's kind of what that looks like. You have a trait. Here's what, it's called queries invoices. And it just creates a new query. But you can kind of hang more methods on this, just trait. And so when you use this trait, like a controller would use it and call, call methods on that. Looks pretty clean. And, and this trait could even implement even more helpful methods, which I'll show you in a second. And by using these data access traits and controllers, it's pretty nice for building up like common queries in your stuff. But the next ingredient I found that like really brought it to the next level was sticking them on form request objects, which is kind of weird. You know, like, so hear me out. You know, form request objects are meant to be used for validating and authorizing form submissions. Um, at least they're presented that way in the documentation. But I like to think of them as like general purpose objects where I can just hang request specific functionality. And if you take this concept a little further, and you can accept the fact that the, you're using these objects for more than just form validation and authorization, it kind of opens up some neat <coughs> possibilities. So like, let's look at my app PushSilver as an example. In PushSilver, we often need to grab invoice models from the database for the currently logged in user. And in PushSilver, the, the tenant is actually the team, as in the, the user is acting on behalf of a team, and it, the team owns all the invoices. And we often have to paginate these results. And so what I did is I created a general purpose form request to house the query, queries invoices trait. In, in my mind, I'm thinking of these form request objects as more of a database request object or a data access object. So like instead of them being considered form request objects, I think of them as database request objects. And this is what that looks like. So you create a new request using the artisan command make request. And I, like this one is like, the base request that all my requests uh, extend from. And it uses that query as invoices trait. And you are required to have the authorize and rules methods there, which is fine, because you can still use those on any other like classes that inherit from this. And this is what the, the queries invoice trait looks like in push silver. Here you can see we're kind of just building up a query using a Fluent interface. 
Um, so we have a, a method invoices that creates a new query object. And the current team pulls the current team for the logged in user, which is available on the form request by default. And then for current team just adds this constraint to the current query using a scope. A scope. And so imagine on the invoice model, we have like a scope called for team. We're just calling it there. And we have a, a fetch method which performs the final query, which this is the, one of the big caveats actually, is you might be uh, tempted to name your methods one to one. Like I wanted to call this git, but because it's already defined on the, the request, you can't do that. So I just had to call it fetch instead. So no biggie, we'll just call it something else. And then here's where we're paginating. But if we had any more methods we needed to add to this trait in the future, we're able to, to extend this trait to add them, you know? And so this trait basically can be thought of as open for extension but closed for modification. Uh, am I doing that right? Is that the right thing? <laughs> so. But I, you know, I really think this is a kind of nice API. The request object gets automatically resolved via the, the Laravel IOC container. And you can throw your validation and authorization in each form request ab object that uh, extends from this. And then you can use it to also grab data from your, uh, your API or your Eloquent models. You know, I feel like it's pretty nice. But I can kind of hear all of the single responsibility, principle loving, hexagonal architecture astronauts dying a little inside. <laughs> so they say, what about testability? Well, it turns out this little trait is actually pretty simple to test. Um, so here's an example of that. We've got a test verifying that if we plop this trait onto any random object that it can get the necessary invoices. In this specific case, we created a, a test fake called invoice fetcher and we've added our little trait here to it. And this is a trait, since this trait assumes that the currently logged in user will be available via the user method, we're just stubbing that method out on that, on that class, that test class. And in our test, we're seeding the database using our, uh, our handy database seeders there. And then we're doing some verification on, on things in our system. So when we call invoices for current team, we're asserting that four of them are returned, which they are because the user with team seeder sets up four by default. Um, if that's not good enough for you, you can actually create a real request object and test that. And so here's an example of doing that. We're creating an instance of the push silver request class and then we're setting the user resolver because the, re the, the request object uh, has a user resolver that resolves the current user. And so we're just stubbing that out here too. But this is better if you're like one of those that really need to like know that it works on a real request object. And that's, this passes even though we didn't have to run it. Uh, I guarantee you that it works. <laughs> 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 I did run it live or run it in my code base when I was writing the talk. so. It does work and it's really easy to use. So. so I say just don't knock it until you try it. You know, it's a pretty nice little pattern you can use if your app is, uh, if it's appropriate for your app. You know, just remember you can do more things with the tools provided by Laravel than just what's on the box or what's in the documentation. You can kind of use and abuse everything that Laravel has if it's convenient for you and your team. I don't know, makes you think. <laughs> you know who this is? The Fresh Prince? <laughs> Come on. Benson? <laughs> no. Oh. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is scheduling models with Laravel Scheduler. And this is probably like the biggest topic and the most like painful thing that I've run up against like four or five of my apps in a row had to like have uh, custom scheduling for models. And so anything from like recurring donation payments, recurring email sending, you know, custom building schedules, daily email digest, all that stuff. Almost every app that I work on needs to have some sort of scheduled tasks. And, uh, someday you'll run into it, I'm sure, if you haven't already. And in the past, I've done this like the extremely hard way. So like one time I needed to have donations come out using uh, like a custom schedule. And my early approach involved having a database table with columns like this. So each do donation was like a different type. So like monthly, twice monthly, and weekly. And there were some weird things that you had to remember for each um, type of donation. So like, this is an example of the schema. My monthly donation type would use the date one column 
uh, for the donation to come out. And that would be like the 15th of the month. Um, and then twice monthly would use both the date one and date two for the two days of the month that it needed to come out. And then finally, my, my weekly one would use only date one, but it meant something different because it was a weekly. It was the day of the week that it needed to come out. And so I had to implement all of this custom logic to kind of figure out when the, day, the, the donation was supposed to be processed. And I'd spin through every donation in the, in the database and then call this method to see if it was supposed to come out or not. And so like, I had three cron jobs running every day for each of those types. And these cron jobs would all fetch all the donations for their type, check if, the time was, if it was time to run them, using some simple logic like this. No. It was like I'd have a donation repository, and I'd get all the twice month leads out. And if they weren't expired, um, or I was, it, uh, this was like a command, so I would run this on a, a cron schedule command. And I could pass in a flag that said if they were expired, and, uh, to, not, to either run all the expired ones or not to run them. Um, and if I passed in a certain day of the month argument, I could run certain ones for the day of month if they were out of schedule. Um, but, man, it was a lot of work to maintain, you know. It's pretty hard to get all of the scheduling and that kind of stuff right. And so I got on the Googles. I was trying to decide, like, what was everybody else doing? You know, surely there was a better way. But at the time that I was building these apps, my, my, I guess my Google foo wasn't good enough, you know, because I couldn't really find any data on that, the kind of subject. Like, surely, like, every company in the world is running into this problem, and there's some sort of abstraction in the composer package that I can just easily use instead of like writing all this terrible code <laughs> to try to figure it out. But I didn't find anything. Um, so the next app I tried to use polymorphism, because Adam Wazen told me it was a good idea. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't listen very well. But in this, you know, like in this example, I, I was using it for push silver. And I had invoices that could be of several different types, again. And so each invoice had a polymorphic relation to an invoice type in the system. So the invoices had an invoice uh, morph one relationship. And there could be monthly invoice types, weekly invoice types, and twice monthly invoice types. And they all had like the different methods of checking whether they should come out or not. But again, Polymorphism can be nice, but checking when a model was supposed to be processed was a real pain in the ass, you know, with all these related objects. And it got worse. You had to, like, what was I supposed to do? So I really tried to put my thinking cap on and think, there has to be a way where, you know, people are, like, custom, like scheduling all of their, like, custom objects, right? It turns out it's already in Laravel called... Uh, the Laravel scheduler. But it was just what I wasn't really looking at it like that. I was thinking that I, I was making it more difficult than it needed to be. Um, and so for people that don't know about Laravel scheduler very much, it lives inside of the app console kernel. And by default, it has this inspire command that I always get rid of. <laughs> um, not that it's bad. <laughs> I just don't need it. I'm just saying. Um, and, but this is the place where you define all your, your scheduled tasks, right? And the Laravel schedule is really powerful, actually. It happens to support closures. Um, so like here we, we're scheduling a closure that deletes all the recent users in the database. <laughs> it doesn't delete the actual users. It's just the recent users. Um, it also supports invocable objects. So you can stick all of the stuff from your your uh, your anonymous function and stick it inside a, a class with an invoke method, and that cleans it up a bit. Um, it also supports artisan commands. So like you can use the, the normal command syntax like you would write in, uh, in your terminal. Or you can just call the command class itself and pass in the arguments as an array. It uh, also supports scheduling queue jobs, which kind of gets us on the track to where we need to be here. Um, so here we're scheduling a, a heartbeat to, to go every five minutes. You can even run arbitrary shell commands. Like if you need to uh, like build your front end assets hourly for whatever reason, you could do that. Ooh, 
You can even schedule all these tasks by using a cron string, which got me thinking. Let's circle back to my original problem. All this is great, but I needed to be able to run commands on a specific schedule. Um, and I wanted each of my models to have their own like custom schedule and honor the time zone for the user. So let's say we had a bunch of web hooks that needed to ping websites at different times in different time zones. Using the Laravel scheduler, we could actually schedule them using something like this. So we have, now the schema has, um, the only real, I should only put the relevant pieces of it, but I kind of want to give you like the full like example. The webhooks database table has a type, so that would store like your twice monthly, monthly, yearly, or whatever. It pings a URL with a, using a certain method and payload. And then the expression here is like the actual cron expression. So I've I uh, figured out a way to store the uh, cron expression for the schedule instead of all this custom, you know, like garbage with polymorphism and, and uh, weird database column stuff. And also there's the time zone there. And I was able to come up with something like this inside my console kernel. I could write my definitions like this. I would schedule a closure. And here we're grabbing all the webhook models that are due right now and then we dispatch a new job for each of them in ping webhook, which just pings the configured website and records the response. And this is what do now look like. Basically not paused is a query scope, and has started is another query scope. And then we get retrieves of webhooks from the database, and then we're filtering them by the results of is do. Is this, is this webhook due to be run? And is do just creates a carbon instance and sets its time zone to the webhook time zone. And then we check that it's time for this webhook to be run using the cron expression library, which is the exact same way that your Laravel scheduler tasks are, are checked. This is working really well. But how do you get the cron string in the database in, in the first place? We have all this set up, and this works if you have a model that has a, a cron expression and a time zone, but how do we get that in the database? Um, well, I was generating cron string using dirty hacks, because I'm a dirty hack from, <laughs> from the Ozarks. <laughs> so basically, w when my webhook model was getting created, they needed to have a cron expression assigned to them, and so what I was doing was during a request, I was getting, when I was getting ready to store a webhook, I would generate the cron expression by creating an ar a carbon instance that represented the type uh, and time of the cron, the time the cron should run. So like if it needed to run weekly on Wednesdays, I would create a carbon instance of a certain day that was Wednesday, and I would kind of use this carbon object as a value object. So like I'd create a new carbon object, and for a weekly webhook, you know, I don't need the year or the, the month, so I'd pass null and because those will get auto-generated. But then I'd pass the day of the week along with the hour and minute from the request when it should run. And those would come from like the UE to the request. And then I'd new up a, a new instance of my schedule generator and return the cron string. So like my schedule generator would return like, like the 30th minute, the 12th hour, the third day of week. And then I'd save that to my eloquent object. But the generator class was kind of a hack. I had, a, I had like, for my for cron dog, I had like six or seven different generators. And they all basically looked like this. They had a template string, and I'd pass that carbon instance into it, and then I'd just return a formatted string from the, the carbon object. Does that make sense? It's it kind of worked, you know. Every, there's a template, and then they accept the carbon instance. And then the generate method would return the formatted string. And I'd save that to the database. And to be honest, I felt really clever <laughs> when I got it to work. Um, but it turns out it was already a solved problem, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, it turns out inside the bowels of Laravel, there's a magical little trait called manages frequencies. Did anybody know about that one? Yeah. Basically, it's this magical little trait that enables you to schedule objects with ease, because like when you call daily, yearly, or every minute on a schedule object, object, you're calling method defined on this trait and updating the cron expression. So like it's home to some of your favorite scheduler methods like daily, yearly, 
in every minute. And it turns out Taylor had already figured out this problem for me, and I could utilize this. Basically, all of these methods just splice in some integers into a certain position in the cron string. So that's basically what I was doing, just like in a more intelligent way. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a ton of really handy methods on this class. You should, you should look through it all. But uh, turns out we can rework my, my shitty scheduling into something a little less shitty by setting up the model this way. So basically, my webhook model would look like this. I'd use the manages frequencies trait to add all those cool scheduling methods to the model. And then I'd need to make sure every model would have a valid default expression. Um, so, but, so I'd set that uh, expression attribute to just like the run every minute. Um, and then lastly, all, all the models would be unguarded. And that, there's no really reason related to scheduling that they need to be unguarded. It's just what I do because you should never mass assign anything on your model directly from the request anyway. So this doesn't really have anything to do with what I was talking about, but I just like doing this on models. And so this is how I check for each type and generate the cron string. And I actually do this in a form request object, but I wanted to keep it simple here. Uh, I tap a new webhook and I force fill it with the, the URL and time zone. And then I switch through the type being sent in the request and I can call these methods on manages frequencies to set the cron string. And it, it's really nice because like I have the weekly on, and I'm accepting the, the weekly day, like the day of the week, and the time from the request. And it just like sets up this cron string automatically. And it does it the exact same thing for minutely, which doesn't actually change anything. Every minute would be like the default anyways. <laughs> But I can add any other type of scheduling that the manages frequency trait requires. And this allows me to like have really weird and like complex scheduling built into my app that I don't really have to test and figure out because it's already in Laravel. And just as a reminder, because we're using the manages frequencies to set the cron expression and time zone on the webhook model, our schedule inside our console kernel is really simple and reliable because you know, it's already tested in Laravel instead of me. And that's an easy, peasy way to give your models custom cron schedules. So. <laughs> so. I have to say goodbye because I don't, yeah, well, running late and you guys probably have to go to the bathroom or something. But um, I wanted to leave you with a closing thought. This is you being sad that I have to go, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. Um, you don't have to reach for a third-party package. You might not like any of the solutions I suggested here, but I hope it helps you get to thinking that there's all sorts of like hidden goodies inside of Laravel, just like like a treasure map or like a like hidden treasure. Like Taylor's a pirate, and he just hides these little pieces inside the ground that you can go find and use them for your app. And you know you can use and abuse and reuse all of the things inside of Laravel already. So that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you.